Well, good morning again, and thanks for being here. You know, as Christians, uh, us Christians, the people that call ourselves Christians, uh, believe in some strange things. Uh, we actually believe that uh, God became human. <laughs> we believe that there was a guy named Jesus who came, right, and became God in human Form. And so uh, we're going to talk about that, and we're going to really take a look at uh, over the next, we're starting a new series this morning called Why in the World? So why in the world, why in, in, in any reason, why would God choose to leave the comfort and, and, and of heaven and the recognition of heaven to live on this ball of dirt called earth? Why in the world would he choose at a time that he chose to come in human form and become a regular guy like us, just a, a regular guy on the bus? I think there was a song once upon a time. Why in the world would God choose to do that in a time that in the, in, in, when, when the best of conditions barely paralleled with the worst of modern day conditions? Before morphine, before indoor plumbing, why would God choose to come and live on this earth as a human? Why in the world would he do that? And so we just kind of believe that. One of the unique things about being a Christian is that God became, we believe that God actually became one of us. And it's interesting when you talk, and, I, and, and I'm telling you, you can go out into your job, you can go uh, wherever you go with your friends and hang out with whoever you want to hang out with, and you can talk about God all day long. You can mention his name, God, and talk about God and faith, and it really doesn't rub people the wrong way. But the instant that you mention Jesus, people are like, oh, he's a little bit crazy. Why is it? The name of Jesus sparks so much kind of angst in people. If you don't believe me, just try it. Just go, go talk and mention the name of Jesus. And, and, and so the fact that we believe this, it's kind of a crazy thought if you really think about it, that God, and I think so many times many of us are trying to rectify who God is. Like, who is God? What's he thinking of me? How, what's my relationship with like with him? He's this big thing in the sky, this big Per, you know, whatever it is, this mystical figure that, that we don't see, we can't, we can't, nobody's seen him, we don't really know what it is, and, and uh, we hear Jesus talk about the Father, and we hear Jesus talk about God, uh, the Father, and that type of thing, but, but then he chose to become human. And to become just like us. And so, uh, so here's what we want to do. We're going to spend a little bit of time. We're really going to take a look at some guys that were, that, that were with Jesus, an historical figure. One of the guys we're going to talk about is John. I think we have a photo of John. That's his photograph right there. Um, <laughs> that's John on the Isle of Patmos. And John's kind of rocking the grunge Moses look there. Uh, but he, he was, uh, John was a real figure. He was a guy that, he was the youngest of the disciples, one of the original 12 disciples that followed Jesus around uh, and, and, and over the three years of his ministry and the course of his ministry. And so John, uh, he, was, uh, he, he, he was exiled to an island called Patmos. And, and the emperor at that time had had it enough with the had had it with the disciples. And instead of making another martyr out of John, which is what they did to a lot of the disciples, they became martyrs and they executed them. But it seemed like the emperor it seemed like to the emperor at that time that when they executed one of the disciples, that more like more Jesus followers popped up. So he was like, okay, instead of just instead of instead of just executing one more and, and creating another martyr, we're gonna take John and we're gonna send him out on this island. Island and he's just going to be stuck there. He's going to be exiled to this Isle of Patmos. And so John, while he was exiled, while he's banished to this island, and banishment kept him from becoming another Christian martyr, but John was not banished for what he believed. John was banished for what he saw. And so what he witnessed, what he looked at, what he, what he began to document while he's uh, on this Isle of Patmos, he began to write. And he began to write letters, which are, are and he, he wrote a book in your New Testament. Uh, John wrote a book in the New Testament called John. <laughs> right. Really creative. Uh, it was just right out there. And then he wrote some more books. He wrote three more, first, second, and third John. 
You find it in the back of your Bible. Uh, he wrote Revelations and he wrote some other stuff. But he wrote these letters. He began to, he began, as he began to be older in age uh, on this Isle of Patmos, he, he thought, hey, I really probably need to write some of this down. I need to document what we saw and, and, and what I saw and what I became. And here's, and here's what he tells us in, in John 1, verse 14. I'm just going to jump right into it. And he said, and the word became flesh. That's ooey and gooey. But it became human. The word became human and dwelt. Basically, that word, if you look it up, means pitched your tent, moved into our neighborhood, and lived next door to us. The word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw. Those are two important words there. We didn't hear about this. Jesus didn't tell us about it. It wasn't some kind of story we heard. We saw it. And who's we? Like, you got a mouse in your pocket, John? Who are you talking about here? So uh, I, I, don't know, uh, I don't know what we're doing there, but uh, uh, is it getting foggy in here? But it's just me. Uh, it's just running and running. But, but John said, we saw, and he's talking about Peter, James, and Matthew, and his glory, and he goes on, his glory as to the begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. In other words, John is saying, hey, we saw it. We, we witnessed it, and, and we saw that God became human. And so basically, and John is saying, in the best summary that I can, in, in, in the three years that I, that, I, that I walked and talked with this guy named Jesus, in the best, of, the best of my ability, the only thing that I can summarize in my experience of walking and talking and being with this guy named Jesus, the best way I can summarize that is that God became human. God became a guy named Jesus. And so why, we're going to tackle this question of why did he come as one of us and live as one of us among us? Why did, why, answer that question. And now, we can, we can tackle the Sunday school answer, right? We know the Sunday school answer is, well, he, be, he came to die for our sins, Trent. Okay, thanks, we're going home. You know, sermon's over. Now, true, he did that. But have you ever really given any thought to why he did that? Why did he choose to come in the way that he came? And you think about the way in ancient times, if you knew anything about the ancient times in this period of time in Jewish history, people were, were trying to aspire to be gods. Like Ju They wanted to be deified. Julius Caesar, they, they deified him. And uh, it was like, hey, we want to become a god and that type of thing. And no one, no one in that period of time in history expected God to to become human and to come in the way that he did. Are you serious? A, he, he came as a baby. No one expected, no one expected God to come in our direction. They just didn't expect that. Emperors wanted to be deified. There were pharaohs. Everybody was going in God's direction. And they really didn't expect him to come, especially in the way that he came as a fragile little tiny baby. Nobody expected that. He couldn't, he couldn't have actually, I mean, he could have actually gone unnoticed. God could have gone unnoticed. He just came as a baby. Nobody expected that. So this is not how God comes. And, and, when, and so here's the other thing. If you're writing this and you're telling this story, that you would not write it like this. It, nobody would make this up. Hey, God came as a tiny infant. If you're telling the story, if you think about it, if you catch a fish, it's the biggest fish you've ever caught, right? If you're telling the story of God, how God came, it's like, no, there was a clap of thunder and there was lightning and everything went dark and earthquakes happened and God showed up. You know, that's what you expect out of a story, right? So nobody can make this up, but God became human to dwell among us. And so why in the world did he become one of us? Why did he bother coming at all? And we know, but it's what Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Peter, James, the brother of Jesus, Peter, Paul, they all believed that, that Jesus came and that God became human. And so the first one, so we're going to talk about that over the next few weeks. And so I want to give some background. We're going to jump in. And I, there's a bunch of reasons that, that we can find in the New Testament of why God became human. Why God chose, why in the world he became human form. And we're going to take a look at some of that in, in John uh, chapter 14. John actually... Let me give you some background. The disciples, and it really the first, the first reason that we get that God came as 
God chose to come as a human, we see in John, and it's really a, a conversation that Jesus was having with his 12 disciples. And it's recorded in John 14. John's basically writing this down, this conversation that took place between Jesus and his 12 disciples. So they're, they're sitting in a room. I don't know what that, they had just celebrated Passover. And then Jesus walks in and says, hey, he announced, hey, guess what? I'm leaving. I'm going away. I'm not going to be here forever. I'm not going to be here very long. I'm, I'm, I'm headed out. And basically, I'm leaving. But then he tells the disciples to do something that none of us can ever really do. And that's like, hey, don't worry. <laughs> I'm leaving, but don't worry about it. You guys are going to be fine. I'm, I'm taking off. And the disciples are like, no, wait a minute, wait a minute. When you go, when you leave, bad things happen. Because you've got that whole Messiah, uh, Son of God thing going on. And if you leave us, we're going we're gonna to be in toast. And so they were having a hard time getting their head wrapped around that. And so Peter says, I, you know, even Peter steps up and says, like, hey, you know what, Jesus, wherever you go, I'm going. I'm, gonna, I'm headed with you. I'm not going to deny you. And, and he's like, yeah, you're going to mess that up, Peter. Just sit down. <laughs> you, know, you don't know what you're talking about. And, and he's like, I'm, no, Jesus, I'm going to be your man. I'm gonna, I've got your back, that type of thing. And Jesus says, no, but John 14, let's jump into it. The first thing he tells his disciples is this, and he tells them to do what basically none of us can ever really do is don't be worried. Do not let your heart be troubled. You, and, and the disciples are thinking, wait a minute, hold on. Do not let your heart, you just told us you're leaving. You just told us you're heading out. And, and Jesus goes on, he says, you believe in God, believe also in me, right? Like you believe in God, don't you? And here's the thing, if you're ever in a room and somebody, you know, says that you have permission just to get up and walk out, well, you believe in God, then just believe in me, <laughs> you know? If you're a human and you're standing there going, you believe in God, why would the, and so can you imagine hanging around with someone who talked like that? Uh, and so believe in me, me and God are kind of the same thing as what Jesus is saying here. Second verse, he said, my father's house has many rooms. And I, I, if you grew up in the church, you've heard that. My, my father's house has many mansions. Uh, you know, sometimes it's translated as rooms. If that were not so, I would have told you that I'm going there. That's where I'm going. Again, Jesus is saying, hey, here's where I'm headed. I'm headed here. I'm going. That's why you can't come. I've prepared a place for you. Basically, I'm going to go see dad. I'm going to get your stuff ready. I'm going to come back and get you. It's basically what he's saying telling his disciples this. And if I go to prepare it, in verse 3, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. In other words, he's saying, hey, I'm going to go. I'm going to prepare this place. I'm going to go see Dad. I'm going to come back and get you. He talks casually about leaving this life, basically. He's like, I'm not going to be here any longer. I'm going away. And, and, and here's, what, here's what really confuses the disciples in verse 4. Now, and just, I want you just for a second, as we're going through this scripture, just picture yourself in this room talking to Jesus and having him say to you what he is saying to these disciples. It would have made no sense to them. Like they're like scratching their heads going, okay, where are you going again? I thought, I thought, you know, we, we, thought you, we thought this was going to be about your kingdom. We thought you were going to, you know, we're going to roll into, we're going to roll into Jerusalem. We're going to overthrow Rome. You're going to be the king. You know, we're going to be connected to you and, and all that good stuff. And we're, we're just going to do that. And it, just imagine what they're saying. And he says something in verse 4. He says, you know the way to the place where I am going. And they're like, hold on, time out. Uh, you know, we don't, we don't really know <laughs> where you're going, Jesus. You know, the way, and they're like, the way, we don't know the way. And here's, here's this, just some other history that, that we would very easily miss in this passage of Scripture. In the early days, people were called Christians. That was a derogatory term. It was kind of like redneck. <laughs> you know, or Hoosier. Oh, you're a redneck or a Hoosier, right? Uh, they were called Christians, and people didn't like it back then, but now we're like, yeah, we're called Christians, we're good with that. It's kind of like, yeah, I'm a redneck, you betcha, you know, somebody, you know, whatever. But back then, Christian, the term Christian was a derogatory term, and so most people referred to this movement, these followers of Jesus Christ, as the way. You can see it all throughout the New, Christ, New Testament. And Jesus said, you know the way. And so Thomas raises his hand in verse 5 and is like, hold on, time out, Jesus, I got a question. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going. <laughs> I don't have any idea what you're talking about here. I don't know where you're going. Can you give us a map? You know, can, we, can we ask Siri? Can we do something? 
Tell us where you're going. We don't know you're where you're going, so how can we know the way? We don't know what you're talking about here, Jesus. And Jesus answered him. And now, this is just a famous verse alert here. Just heads up. Verse 5. Thomas said that in verse 6 is the famous verse. Jesus answered and said, what did he say? I am the way. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I am the way. Thomas is saying, hey, we don't know the way. And Jesus is saying, you do know the way because you know me. You know the way. You know the way to where I'm going. And if you read that verse, that is incredibly narrow, isn't it? I mean, and, and here, here's the thing. If you're not a Christian here today and you have a hard time believing in all this stuff, this should be the reason that you're not a Christian, <laughs> probably. Because if, if you're not a Christian, this, should be the, this is the reason you shouldn't be a Christian. Not because you've done business with Christ. It has not, if, you know, if you just choose to believe that Jesus wasn't the way, and it's like, well, that's just too narrow-minded for me. I can't believe that. I'm not buying into that. That Jesus is the only way that you can get to the Father. I'm just not, I'm just not part of that. I'm not gonna. That maybe should be the only reason that you're not a Christian. I'll give you that. But here's the thing, that should be the reason you're not a Christian, not because you've dealt with Christians or other people that you know to be Christians. You've gotten a bad haircut, but you still get your your haircut, right? We've all had bad experiences with Christians or people that 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 have claimed to be Christians, and we've had a bad haircut, you've had a bad haircut, but you still get one. The reason that you should not be, maybe, is that it, because it's really offensive. That verse is offensive. Hey, the only way is through me. You're not getting there any other way. There's, I, I'm, this is not compromise. This isn't up for debate. This isn't a, this, I am the way. That's the only way you're going to get there. Verse 7, he says, if you really know me, you will know my father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip has stopped had to stop and ask a question. We've all probably asked a question, and this is such a powerful question in verse 8 when he goes on. Because Philip says this, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be good enough for us. That will be enough for us. Isn't that interesting? How many of you have been there? Like, man, if, if I could just, if I could just know, if I could just see God for a second, you know, I know people that, that have lost loved ones, even, you know, uh, Cheryl, when she lost her brother. I know for her, one of the things that we want to believe that, they're, that God's word is true, and we want to believe that if we're faithful and we, we give our life to Christ and we, we accept that, we want to believe that they're in heaven and, and everything is good and everything is golden. But I can't tell you the number of times that Cheryl has said to me, you know what, if, there's, if I could just see Tommy for a second, if I could just if I could just look into if I could just look into a TV and see him in heaven and know that it's good, isn't that true about God sometimes? If we could just see it, and that's where Philip is right here in this passage. It's the same thing. It's such a great question. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Man, if we could just see it, if we could just, you know, that would settle our fear, that would give you assurance, it would motivate us. And Jesus points him out. You know, and I don't know about you, but, you know, uh, being a Christian was all, you know, as a kid, I, I've been a Christian my whole life. I've, I've been, I was, I, was, I was born in church, I think, not literally. That would be awkward. Um, but I was, I was born on a Wednesday. I think I was in church on Wednesday, and I just, I, I've, I've been a Christian my whole life. But really, for me, uh, becoming a Christian, I was really, uh, early on, the reason why I made a decision to follow Christ was like, hey, do you want to go to heaven or hell? I'm <laughs> like, well... <laughs> what options are there, <laughs> you know? I guess I'll go to heaven. And it was more about fear than it was about love for, for me growing up, and, but it worked, uh, and, and that's just the way it works. And so, if, but if we just knew for certain there was a God, that God knows my name, and Philip is saying, just show us the Father. Then in verse 9, Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip, even after I have been among you for such a long time? In other words, I've been, I have walked with you for three years. I have talked with you. Don't you know who I am by now? 
Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? How can you even say that, Philip, when I've been right in front of you the whole time? In other words, God in human form was Jesus. Now, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you're like, yeah, Trent, we get that. We, we understand that. In other words, I am as, Jesus was saying to these, these disciples, I'm as close to the Father as you're going to get. I, I'm, as, I'm, I'm as close to the real thing as you're going to see. And this is a huge statement. If you want to know what God is like or what the Father is like, then Jesus is saying, watch me. They don't get it. These disciples don't get it. We don't get it either. And so verse 10, it says, don't you believe that I am the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. In other words, Jesus is saying to them, you want to know what God is like? You want to know what he says? Listen to me. Do you want to know what God thinks about a certain subject? Listen to me. Do you want to know what God thinks about this or that? Listen to me. Do you want to know what God would say to a person or people you work with or a certain situations or, or the stuff that goes on on social media? Listen to me. And he goes on, he says, Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. In other words, you want to know what God is up to? Watch me. You want to know what God would do in this situation? Watch me. How God would get involved in our communities and our society? Watch me. How he would react to certain situations in our, in our politics and in uh, uh, the world? Watch me. That's what Jesus is saying to his disciples here. So you'll never get a better clue about what God is like. So if you're searching for God and want to know what God is like and who is he and how, how he lives and works and how he thinks, you'll never, get a better, you'll never get a better example than Jesus. You won't. This brings us to the first reason, I think, of why God came in human form. And it's this, to communicate and to demonstrate what God is like. You want to know why God came? Do you want to know why he wanted to come in human form? It's so that he could demonstrate and communicate what he is really like through his son Jesus. We had a living, breathing example that was just like us. It's personal. God wants you to know him in such a personal level that he sent himself not a bunch of information. He's like, you know what, I could send a messenger, I, and, and he had done that. God had sent prophets all throughout the Old Testament. But he decided, you know what, the best way for me to demonstrate and communicate what I'm like is I'm just going to come in human form in Jesus. And I'm going to walk, and I'm going to be tempted every the way they're tempted, and I'm going to suffer every way that they've suffered, and even greater, and I'm going to experience everything they experienced. And they will have a living, breathing, working example of how we are supposed to behave and how can we can be more like God. That's how we know. Verse 11 says, Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. Jesus, pay attention to this, Jesus didn't claim to have the best explanation of God. He claimed to be the best explanation of God. He didn't claim to say, hey, this is, this is the best way I can describe Jesus. He said, or this is the best way I can describe God. He said, I am God. I'm it. I am God in the flesh. That's why he came, to demonstrate and to communicate to us how that was. You know, and I think pastors, people like me and Mark and all, pastors all over the world and people who stand in front of congregations everywhere, priests, and it doesn't matter what denomination, I don't care. We can stand up and we can give you the best explanation that we can. And we, you know, that, but Jesus was the explanation. He was living, breathing. If you're a Christian, hear me this morning. If you are a Christian, if you call yourself a Christian, and you believe what the, the New Testament, you believe that the New Testament part of your Bible is true, and, and you believe that all these guys lived through this and wrote about it, and it's amazing because you have the best opportunity to know what God is like by listening to Jesus Christ and what he says in the New Testament and what these guys that lived with him and walked with him wrote and recorded and wrote down. Jesus lived among us to show us what God was like. 
So here's our challenge. Here's where it kind of becomes practical. And I, you know, I, I go through all that in, that in that conversation that Jesus had with his disciples. And you're like, yeah, Trent, that's great. We've read that before. We believe that Jesus is God. We believe that he is what he, that he was flesh. The, you know, we, how, does that, how, does that, how does that apply to my life? How does, how, does, how does that work in 2019 here in Salem, Illinois? How in the world is that? What, what does that do? And here's, here's the thing. We look... Here's our challenge. You and I have an inclination to look for God by looking at all of the wrong things. Did you know that? We look for God by looking at all of the wrong things. And we look at, we, we look at first of all, we look at our circumstances. Christians say, have you ever heard a Christian say like, have you ever heard a Christian say this? Well, it's a God thing. <laughs> well, what do you mean? It's a, that's a God, that's God, and this is a thing. Have you ever heard anybody say that? Like it's, ah, it's just a God thing. It's because we're looking into our circumstances to find God. We piece together events and say, oh, that's God. Oh, there's God. Oh, that, that must be God. Our ability to interpret circumstances is terrible. We're not good at it. And circumstances that start bad end up good and vice versa. So let me give you an example. Oh, no, I lost my job. Where's God? Why is God? I lost my job. I, couldn't, I, I didn't see that coming. Where's God in all this? Why did he do that? And then we find something that's even better and pays more. And we're like, oh, there's God. That's God. But then when things don't work out, you know, it's, it's, like, it's like the teenage girl that just right now is praying, oh, dear God, dear God, please let him ask me out to prom. Please let me, oh, God, I just pray that, I just pray so much that he, you know, he is so good looking, God, and I want him to ask me to prom. And then he doesn't ask, and she's like, well, God didn't answer my prayer. And then on the flip side, you have a mother going, oh, dear God, please don't ask him to, oh, God. Please, God, don't, I don't want him to ask her to prom. And then he doesn't ask her, like, oh, thank God, God answered my prayer, right? We look at circumstances and we twist them all different ways. And then fast forward 10 or 15 years and that same girl is like, oh, God, I'm so glad he didn't, I'm so glad he didn't ask me to prom. I'm so, God was good. He answered my prayer, right? It's the way we work. We look at God and say, he broke up with me. Oh, where is God? Ten, fast forward five, ten years. Oh, I'm so glad I got out of that relationship. God answered my prayer. I found Mr. Right. You know, that type of thing. Parents and kids see things every differently, you know. I didn't get invited to the party. Where's God? Parents are like, thank you, God. We look at our circumstances. We look at our religious traditions. We just spent four weeks talking about the temple model, don't we? We try to find God in our religious traditions. We associate phrases that we pick up along the way that define God accordingly. And traditions systemize, customize, overemphasize, and fossilize. <laughs> If you were, let me give you an example. If you were raised in a legalistic church, maybe growing up very legalistic, you worked for his approval and he's watching and, and, and he's looking for sin and you always felt like you never measured up. Maybe you were raised in a liberal home and everything was right and everything was good and she felt, but it felt distant and it didn't feel personal. Maybe you were raised in an evangelical tr tradition and God had memory problems and you kept having to pray this magic prayer over and over and over to forgive your sin. And We love systematic things. We like to have answers. We like to be able to say, here's, here's what the Bible says. But the fact of the matter is there's some things that are contradictory and we're like, some things, it's hard for pastors to even, you know, it's even hard for pastors to stand up and say, well, you know what, I really don't know. I don't know. I, I don't have an answer for that. There are things in our society, there are, there are circumstances that, that we wrestle with. We talk about it every week in staff meeting. How are we going to handle that? I don't know. What's the right thing? What would Jesus do? What does love require of me? We, but we would love to have a systematic answer. We would love to have a pattern to follow, wouldn't we? That's because we look to our religious traditions to find God. We customize it. We make it fit our agenda. You know, we take this verse or that verse. Oh, I like that one. Ooh, I don't like that one. I <laughs> don't really like what that one says, but I like what this one says. If that's your primary way of knowing God or who God is, religious systems, it is incredibly limited. 
Some of us were raised in a very legalistic church, and I don't even know why we had a Bible. We just needed a three-by-five card that said no. We're going to turn to chapter 1. We're going to turn to chapter 1, verse 1. No, thank you. Let's end the close in prayer. You know, everything was no. Can I do that? No. Can I, can I behave that? No. It's just very legalistic, you know. It's just a three-by-five card. Some of us are raised in very liberal thinking. We believe that everything and, and, and God is non-personal. And why, why is your God so... And, and maybe you were raised in a liberal environment, but then you went to summer camp with a kid, and you're like, wait a minute, why is your God so personal and mine isn't? Some of you were raised in churches that when you became a Christian, felt like you automatically became a Democrat. Some of you were raised in churches where if you weren't a Republican, you weren't really a Christian. Every Sunday, politics and religion began to be intertwined, didn't they? And every passage of Scripture had some sort of political element to it that we'd like to beat people up with. Right? So I talked about last week, used the, the Bible as a bat. And you read the same Scripture and like, wait a minute, I don't, I don't, get, I don't get that. I don't think Jesus, I don't think that's what Jesus meant. I don't really think that that's right. And you know what the matter is? Both of these dividing elements that we have in our culture today, both of them can't be right. I have a theory. I think they're both wrong. Jesus did not come to take sides. He came to take over. Your church didn't know you know, maybe you're raised in a church and you grew up in this church and loved this church and all of a sudden your parents got divorced and, it, and the way that people treated your parents and messed you up. Maybe, maybe you had a, maybe you grew up and all of a sudden your brother came out and said, hey, I'm gay. And we saw how the church reacted to that. Like, what in the world? What does love require of me? Maybe your sister got pregnant <laughs> in church. Not in church, hopefully. <laughs> but maybe, you're, maybe your sister got pregnant and you saw how the church treated her. They customize the way your church... There's a better way to look for God. There is a better way to look for God, and it's in Jesus. We look with, you know, maybe you're somebody that's like, well, I just look within. I do this whole Zen thing, and I sit, and I, and it's all about the within and meditation. And I just, you know, the problem with that is that the within is limited to what's within, <laughs> And the fact of the matter is we pay close attention to our thoughts and that the, the God is bigger than what's in within. And the 16-year-old, with the 16-year-old, what was within you at 16 is not the same as what's within you at 30. <laughs> Trust me, I'm a lot tired, more tired. Some of our within is determined by some of the pills we take in the morning. <laughs> some of your family like you better when you're on those pills. Some of, the, some of our family like the within that's within us when we're on our pills and our meds. Some of us like to just look at nature. Well, I just like to get out in nature. I love to look at nature and see God in nature. And that's true. At a, you know, a thousand miles up, nature's beautiful. You can see God's handiwork. I'm, I love that. Nothing I love better than sitting in the deer stand and just finding, listening to the wind blow through the trees and feeling God there, I do. But when you drill down through nature, nature, nature up close will kill you. <laughs> nature is brutal. It's survival of the fittest. I watched a video this week of an eagle attacking a pig. <laughs> Can anybody see that? Oh. Giant eagle swoop down and get this pig and you find yourself rooting for the pig. You're like, come on, buddy. He didn't make it. It's because nature is brutal. And when you dig down to it, nature is survival of the fittest.
There's little compassion and zero forgiveness and justice in nature. We find hidden sin clues in all these places of God. But in Jesus, we find demonstration of who God is. John 1.18 says that Jesus explained him. No one has ever seen God but the one and only Son who is himself God in closest relationship with the Father. He has made known. He has explained him. Why in the world would Jesus come to communicate and demonstrate what God is like? If you look past Jesus, you will miss him. You will miss God completely if you look past Jesus. If you look in some other direction, you will miss him. You won't find him out there. You're not going to find him in here. You're going to find it. Why is that so? Because there are things that God, we would never know about God unless we had the certainty of Jesus had not revealed them. So here's the thing. In conclusion, while it's true that Jesus came to die for us, he lived his life to explain the Father. He, if we look past Jesus, we'll miss him. The Father wants to be known. He wants us to know how he is. He wants us to know. He wants a relationship with you. It is personal. It is human. He wants you to know that. And because he wanted you to know it so bad, and because we knew he knew in our, in our finite minds that we couldn't possibly comprehend everything that he was, that he would actually have to become human to demonstrate that. So if you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, let me help you with that. Let Pastor Mark, let us help you with that. Get with somebody. Help, let me help you understand what that looks like. So here's, I've got homework. I'm done. I know some of you, I'm, I'm long. Jeremy sang too long. Just kidding. Just kidding. Here's the thing. Here, here's your homework, okay? I want you to go home this week. And pick out a book out of the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. Okay, one of the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. I don't know. I don't care which one. Luke is kind of more of a chronological kind of how it happened. You know, Luke was a physician, so it's very kind of detailed. I don't care which one you pick. Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. Pick one. Pick your favorite Gospel. And I want you to read that. We're going to look at that. You know, we're going to look at some things in the next couple of weeks. But I want you to take your homework and pick one and ask yourself this one question when you read this. You might want to write it down. What do I learn about the Father from the Son? When you're reading through that passage, I want you to answer that question. What is it that I learn about God through Jesus? What is it that I learn about God? What, what, what truth is spoken to me when I read through this book of the Bible? When I hear what Jesus did, when I hear what he said, when I, when I hear and see and listen to what he did and how he acted and how he treated people and how he forgave people and how he communicated and how he loved, what does that tell me about the Father? Can you do that? I'm going to check with you all next week. I don't, you know, unless the dog ate your Bible, it's not an excuse. Stand with me. Let me pray for you. Father, thank you so much for sending your son in human form to help us understand why in the world that you came to demonstrate and to communicate to us what you are like. Your goodness to us, your faithfulness, that you are a good, good God that wants a personal relationship with each and every one of us. Lord, I just pray that you would help us connect that. Help us connect the dot between you and the Father this week. Help us to get into your word. Help us to share our faith outside of this building. Help us to continue to be a missional church that looks to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with other people. Father, we thank you so much for your goodness and your faithfulness to us. Walk with us today.